Hello, Marcel here, and today I will show a couple of small features in Lucid that can have a big impact on the production and the final look of your simulations. To show the first feature, I have created a quick little plane with 30 by 30 segments to make it relatively complex but yet not too dense, and I have applied a Lucid modifier with a cloth preset to this plane. This way we will be simulating it as a cloth object. I use the mesh select modifier that is right below the Lucid modifier to pre-select a couple of vertices and this will be fixed during the simulation while the rest of the cloth object will be going down under its own gravity. So inside the Lucid modifier I change the tearing parameter to 0.6 to make it tear in those places which are stressed the most. And I have also set the left and right count spinners under the tearing to 3 so that instead of tearing clean off it will create strands of the cloth that that are not torn. I also used the new select torn vertices option which is the key of this feature and what this will do it will pre-select the vertices that have been torn from their neighboring faces and that will be the output of this lucid modifier. So I'm just going to exit my sub object mode and then I will hit the record button to record my active time range. Once the recording is done and I can play back my simulation I will scroll to a frame where we have some kind of tearing happening and then I will add a mesh select modifier on top of my cloth object. If I select the vertices at this point, we can see that some of them are selected and these are exact vertices that have been affected by the ripping of the cloth. So these are the vertices that have been torn while all the other vertices have been left in place. If I just go back and forth in scrubbing my simulation right now, we see that the vertices are not dynamically selected and deselected and this is more of a bug inside 3ds Max because Lucid is actually selecting the vertices on the fly, but it seems that both Mesh Select and Edit Poly as well as Edit Mesh Modifier are not updating this selection as we are scrubbing the timeline. But this is not a problem because if you apply more modifiers further down the modifier stack, they will actually respect the selection as it changes during the tearing process. So one of the things I can do now is, for example, go into the face mode and I can get my vertex selection, which will select the faces by lucid tearing, and then I can go and apply some like a tessellate modifier which will add details just to these faces while leaving the rest of the mesh intact. So you see that these faces are now more detailed than others and as they are ripping you can add some other effects to these specific faces. For example you can add a noise modifier or you can even do something more funky like adding a deformer such as a melt deformer that affects just these vertices and let me just increase the amount. And in this cases the melt modifier is being applied to this static selection but if you don't want it to be static we can get rid of our mesh select modifier and instead use melt just on the selected vertices. For this you will need to go into vertex sub object mode inside mesh select or even better if you add an edit mesh modifier it should update the vertices dynamically so the melt modifier will be applied to the vertices as they are torn. This creates a somewhat interesting effect of course this might not be what you use in a realistic production but nevertheless this shows the parametric power of the modifier stack to be able to do things with just the vertices that have been torn by Lucid. This is one of those things that can add a lot of production value if you need control just in these areas. If you want you can use something like Max Creation Graph to dynamically convert vertex selection into face selection and then do things like dynamically tessellate the faces that have been torn. Unfortunately I could not find a way to do this out of the box without using any third party tools for this tutorial. So for the next part of the tutorial I wanted to show how to randomize the voxelization process of particles for fluid and rigid bodies. So you can add some randomness into your simulation and even make your simulations more complex. Let me show you how. So first I'll just add a global collision sandbox into my scene and by default it is very big so let me change its size to something smaller maybe 100 in all dimensions and then it's going to be way off outside of our initial view space so let me reset the Z coordinate to zero and bring this collision box all the way down so we can see and play with it. So next I'm going to add some kind of object. Let's add a tube. I'm just going to make it a little bit smaller so that it fits nicely inside of our collision object. I'll turn off the grid and maybe I'll place the tube a little bit outside of the center of the scene. So I will apply a standard water preset onto my tube and I'll just use a global flex settings to make sure that the tube will splash when it's simulated. So let me just see what it looks like at this point. So when I simulate my tube we get a nice splash and there is a lot of detail going on in the 
the simulations in terms of like secondary splashes and water droplets going up. Problem is, if I wanted to drop the same tube at the same place twice, for example, if I wanted to create another tube, it will produce the same deterministic result as we are getting in this case. So all the splashes and all the water droplets will be placed in exactly the same locations. And if we, for example, record all of these liquid particles and then do it again, they will be in exact same locations. And sometimes if you want to add more complexity to your simulation, you can simulate it twice, but you don't want particles to be all in the same place. So to control this, we have the initial jitter and a random seed parameter. So let's set the initial jitter value to something other than zero. This value is relative to the particle size and it's not a world scale value. So you do not really have to set it to a big value, something like 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 will do its job just nicely. So let me set it to 0 0.2 and see what happens. As we simulate now, the particles are still holding together, but they have been moved around just a little bit by our algorithm to make them a little bit different from before in a random way. So if you wanted to change this again, we would just need to change the random seed to a different value. And then once we simulate at this point, the splashes and all of the little dots will be in different locations, even though our main overall shape will be mostly the same. And this is due, of course, to the fact that the particles have been jittered ever so slightly and the initial state or initial condition for our simulation has been changed. So with this knowledge, you can go and record your simulations out to LRD files or PRT files, and then you can accumulate multiple files of the same object, but with slightly different jitter. And this way, essentially simulate many more particles accumulated over multiple simulations into one very complex water object, which can then be meshed or used in any other ways to render it. And this is just one of the ways that you can use jittering and randomization in your production scenario. So I hope you have learned something for yourself from this quick little tutorial, and I will see you next time. Thank you for watching.